Okay. Welcome to this week's Tuesday discussion with Anna Bartsch and Paolo Copuso. Uh, I'm really excited about this. We don't normally have two people for the Tuesday discussion and uh, not such an exotic topic. Today is about deep mapping. My name is Christoph Bauch. I'm the director of the Rage Castle Center and together with my colleague Dr. Gisa Lüdecke, uh, we are moderating and organizing the Tuesday discussions and today it's my turn and I'm excited about it. Uh, we have two really interesting scholars here. Um, Anna Bartsch comes from Warsaw. She spent some time at Trinity College. She studied multiple things, one after the other, so it's difficult to place her in a discipline, which is possibly good for looking at deep mapping. I wonder if you did philosophy first and something else, and then uh, literature. Uh, you've got your PhD in literature, and now you're working in history. Um, and I, I think this is fascinating, but Anna is known to us. Uh, I think it was after her time at uh, Trinity College, where she got a Marie Curie, she came to the Carson Center and she finished a book here on um, environmental cultures in Soviet Eastern Europe. And um, she loves to teach, so she had a chance to teach today in a, a walking workshop on deep mapping. She says uh, she really would love to teach all the time, but then she always ends up in research positions. And maybe that's the reason why she uh, published quite a few books. So the book she finished here was sort of already the third book. Before that she had published a book about eco um, ecological realism and one about vulnerable realism. Everybody knows Paolo Guposo because he's now here. Well, he's not here, but he's in the Landhaus, but he used to be here. Uh, he's a social anthropologist who studied with a famous anthropologist in Aberdeen, Tim Ingold, who many of you know. Um, Paolo originally comes from Rome and uh, is a social anthropologist, got his first degrees from uh, Sapienza, the Wisdom University in Rome. Yeah. And um, I could, he's uh, been at the Max Planck Institute, he's uh, now working on wetlands in Italy. I could tell you more, but the one thing I will tell you, which you don't know, is that he used to be, in his former life, he used to make tattoos. But uh, I'm really excited about listening to them. They will each speak for about 10 minutes. I think Paolo starts with a more theoretical part. Yeah, yeah. more theoretical. Well, and then Anna oh, uh, continues. Oh, oh are you missing something. the theory? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, I'm excited. I hope you're excited to join me in welcoming Anna and Paolo. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, and uh, thank you for letting us organize this uh, um, experimental workshop on uh, um, deep mapping. So um, there is not much time, so what I want to do is just to give you um, uh, an overview of this approach as I um, uh, see it, uh, as I actually approach it. Um, because deep mapping is uh, a fairly um, ambiguous kind of term and approach. Uh, it actually pivots precisely on ideas of uncertainty and uh, on making us more uncertain of our... Um, uh, unsettling, yeah, our academic, let's say, uh, certainties. Um, so this term emerges, I think, in the... Uh, early uh, 80s uh, from a wide variety of uh, approaches such as performative arts, um, uh, critical geography and non-human geography, uh, of course social anthropology, um, literary studies, uh, used to uh, stimulate uh, conversations um, and explorations about and into uh, uh, places. So just to give you um, an insight from um, uh, Nuno Sarramento, uh, who is the guy who actually initiated me to deep mapping. Uh, so he says, deep mapping is an investigation of a site of your choice and the discovery of what is often hidden behind the official, sanctioned and authorized. Deep mapping is about doing things differently from ordinary cartography, shifting away from large expanses of territory. Rather, it is about the small, the subjective, the embodied, the thick, and the porous. So deep mapping is 
about place, is about subjectivity, embodiment, and it challenges the authority of modern, cartogra of modern cartography and its underlying uh, political uh, implications. And these political implications uh, is, are really embedded in modern uh, uh, cartography. And this, for example, emerged if you look at uh, maps of, uh, at, at modern maps of uh, places like uh, marshlands, uh, the unruly environments par excellence. This is, are um, maps from uh, the region I come from and, and the region I, I studied, uh, while the continent merges in, 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 uh, in other continents. So these are really beautiful um, uh, maps of the marshes from the 16th century until the 1940s, when the area was completely reclaimed from the, uh, by the fascist regime. Um, but comparing, I mean, this map with, uh, confronting this map with historical records, what I uh, discovered, let's say, is that each of these maps is very much related with um, uh, projects of reclamations of the marshes. So basically my uh, discovery working with old maps was that these were not just nice representations of the marshes, but were actually plans for their uh, really annihilation. Uh, there were plans of attack to subjugate what was perceived uh, an unruly environment to the principle of authority. And this discovery opened my mind to um, what Dennis Wood uh, calls the powers of maps. Dennis Wood is a pretty influential um, critical geographer from the US. Um, this book is present in our library, so I invite you to uh, have a look at the book. And so he says, Far from being pictures of the world, maps are instruments for its creation. That is, they are not representations, but systems of propositions, arguments about what the world might be. It was this propositional logic that made maps attractive to states in the first place and makes them more and more valuable to the state uh, every day. So indeed, modern cartography played a key role in expressing this principle of authority, like in the colonial project or in the formation of nation states, and to implement forms of territorial totalitarianism, such as land reclamation. This, of course, does not apply only to the Pontine marshes or to wetlands. There are other kind of unruly environments. So this is the um, I'm not an expert, but these are maps from the um, Isar River. And, and, uh, and, and you see really the transformation of the river. So we can say that uh, these maps were actually uh, key to, to um, uh, transform this unruly environment into its actual linear, uh, linear, uh, uh, linear shape. Um, And so this linear shape, which is basically uh, what we call actually a river, is the, actual, uh, the, the outcome of uh, modern cartographic um, uh, imagination. So what these images suggest is that maps have a strong uh, political and performative power that is concealed behind the modernist and deceiving veil of objectivity. So they conceal the mapping behind the map by selling models for descriptions, mirrors for snapshots, and in doing so, they perpetuate the principle of authority. While rejecting this principle, deep mapping reverses the process. It emphasizes mapping over maps and movements over static forms. So it reveals the hands that make the drawing, and in doing so, it reclaims the value of imagination, subjectivity, experience and creativity in making sense of the world we live in. Deep maps, to use other, another quote by Cliff McLucas, who is another pioneer of this approach, so he says, deep maps do not seek the authority and objectivity of conventional cartography. They are politicized, passionate, and partisan. They will involve negotiation and contestation over who and what is represented and how. They will give rise to debate about the documentation and portrayal of people and places. Deep maps are unstable, fragile, and temporary. 
they will be a conversation and not a statement. So we can say that deep mapping is strongly authorial, but it challenges uh, authority. So I started working on this process, on this uh, perspective uh, myself, taking inspiration from environmental anthropology and phenomenological approaches to landscape. And I made experiments, um, uh, for example, with my path track. Um, I will show you later um, this actual map, which is beautifully uh, screen printed. Uh, and this is something that we made uh, at, in Aberdeen, Scotland. And it was originally equipped with a map of uh, augmented um, reality. So the idea was that people could actually navigate the, um, the map with this phone and, and to see videos and text and, uh, and photos coming out from the map. And they could actually upload their own uh, materials on the map. And the idea was precisely to emphasize um, uh, mapping over um, the process of mapping um, over the map precisely as a process, as an uh, unfinishing kind of process open to um, everybody. And the inspiration uh, came from uh, uh, this idea that places not only are they happen as um, the um, famous uh, phenomenologist Edward Casey um, uh, wrote. Um, so uh, what we wanted to do was precisely to grasp this, this uh, happening, you know, being aware that any place has stories that bring it into being. So it was a way to grasp the temporality uh, of a place, this particular place, as it unfolds through the life and the historical presence of many beings. And this, of course, means to emphasize the embodied experience of being alive in a particular environment and getting to know that environment deeply, emotionally, uh, beyond cartographic authority, and responsibly. Um, and working in this sense is, to me, very uh, critical, because it triggers a, a very specific kind of knowledge that grows from the immersion in a particular place and, and uh, from engaging physically, again, and emotionally uh, with that place. And, uh, Again, following this uh, scholar, uh, Leslie Inston, um, she writes beautifully about uh, walking, and she says that is a way to become more aware that we participate in the making of the world at each step, meshing things past and those to come in an ongoing process, knitting together responsibility for past, present, and um, uh, future. So deep mapping, as I understand it, is precisely a way of meshing things, uh, pay attention to others, <coughs> human and other than humans, and being responsible to these multiple others, both as we walk along, uh, finding our way through, as much as in the stories we tell and how we tell those uh, stories. And I found this approach very interesting also for educational purposes, following the etymology of the uh, term education that has been recently um, um, retraced by uh, Tim Ingold as ex you know, leading out. So being exposed to uh, uncertainty instead of being filled in with information. And so I started making um, workshops in different contexts, and here you see some uh, uh, pictures at the University of Gastronomic Sciences and, uh, and at Oslo at the um, uh, summer school of um, the doctoral school of environmental humanities. Uh, and the idea was precisely to create a space for leading students out and, and um, to expose them physically to the environment, but also uh, intellectually uh, trying to unsettle their, uh, the, the, the usual academic uh, format. And of course, this approach, and I conclude really here, uh, resonates with uh, anthropological sensibilities because it recalls, for example, indigenous ways of thinking about maps and knowing the land. Famously, um, Aboriginal people in Australia think of the land as something that emerges along um, uh, stories that are related to the historical movements of their community through the land. So to tell those stories means to map the land, and to map the land means to tell 
those uh, uh, stories no? with, the, with the word of Aboriginal scholar uh, Milroy, who, who's um, uh, Jill Milroy, who writes, it is not people who are the best storytellers, the birds, the animals, the trees, the rocks and the land, our mother, have the most important stories to tell us. These stories exist in place, and my mapping these story systems, we fundamentally alter the way in which we can know uh, countries. So a completely different understanding of what mapping uh, uh, is and, and, and can be. Thank you. It's really inspiring to rethink you know, how we not only map uh, the environment, the outside, but what's going on in our human minds, in our perceptions. And there is a big question uh, <laughs> behind it, to what extent we can change how people perceive the environments through deep mapping. So it's not only about creative practice and having fun. It's also about some you know, changes that, uh, that I think uh, they, they might, uh, they, they, there is some uh, potentiality in, uh, in, what, uh, in what people do with uh, deep mapping. So, um, so I would like, of course, to make a very short position speech where uh, you will find out uh, that uh, not only uh, using GIS maps or uh, using the maps that uh, historical cartography introduced us to is uh, something that we work on, but also perhaps there are other figures like this triangle <laughs> that I started my adventure with uh, deep mapping, in fact, uh, can be also um, helpful. And uh, my deep mapping efforts uh, so far uh, were connected with uh, narratives and textual sources. So uh, through these sources, I was also trying to, uh, to review, especially river-related um, uh, materials. And, uh, but I think it, it might be this triangle that I'm going to speak a little bit more, uh, I think it, it can apply to, uh, to other um, uh, bodies of uh, water. And uh, I will uh, refer uh, to, um, to a project that uh, formally is finished, but it opened uh, a lot for me and uh, it, uh, I was working on the Vistula uh, River, and it's called Aqua Critical Vistula, and I think this triangle is an aqua critical triangle that um, that I will explain a little bit more. And I also created some deep maps, and there are some links. So if anyone is uh, uh, interested, I also uh, created with my team um, an atlas of deep maps of the Vistula, which is available online. So it's nothing to, you know, to, to hide. But uh, a motto for my approach, something that um, accompanies me for long. Uh, and I think it accompanies me um, since I began my eco-critical um, um, practice, academic practice, it comes from Adorno, aesthetic theory. And, uh, and this is... Um, and this is what I do. Uh, I try to, to speak the river, I try to translate the river, and uh, find uh, the, river, uh, the river's voice, and where is it appropriated, where is it silenced, where, where, is, where is it muted by human domination and anthropocentric culture. And in this overview, I included uh, the frame that is uh, partly philosophical, uh, partly, well, it's hard to say, but uh, I think there are some questions that bothers me. And um, mm, one is animate and inanimate nature. So, uh, so this is something that I don't think that in, uh, within Western tradition um, 
is uh, it's it's it, it can be uh, uh, it can be answered now, but. Uh, but this is something that I think reappears in literature. So literary uh, language, literary experimental way of uh, silencing humans also, human subjectivity can be helpful. Um, where we don't have indigenous cultures, we don't have you know, this tradition of naturally perceiving uh, the world as, as animated, uh, the world, non-human world. But also the category of disturbed env environments. So what is left? Uh, what is what is left that is alive? And uh, renaturalization of rivers asks this question as well: What is left of the river? And what do we renaturalize? What do we revitalize? Um, and also deep and counter mapping. So critical cartography. Um, uh, ask also this kind of question, what do maps want? What stories <coughs> they tell now? And um, yes, and I think that literature, but also other artistic sources and all, all those you know, approaches that can transgress anthropocentrism. So this is what I should say. The criteria for collecting the sources in, uh, in this project on the Vistula, but also uh, probably in other, uh, in other uh, of my um, uh, I don't know, papers or in my, in my research practice, are as follows. I seek how to express more than human trauma. So I, I extend this concept also because of war ecologies and pollution. So deep mapping is also about you know, including this layer in our environments. And the Vistula is a great example because of the Second World War. So it's, it has been a river of, of blood <laughs> uh, since, I think, the Tatars in the early modern period. <laughs> but it is, uh, it is also full of blood. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, and the different, it's differently put, this memory, uh, and what happened materially with the river is definitely put in, um, in, the, in the recent sources from the Second World War. But also, what is the language of the river element when it overtakes humans, when it's not a river that is vulnerable and fragile? What kind of redefinitions are connected to monstrosity of the river. I was working on the Odra River that flooded uh, massively in 1997. And I learned that it's a monstrous, it's a, it's a powerful actor, yes? So, um, so what are the oppositional ways of subor subordinating uh, non-humans, uh, all, all, all of them? And, uh, and I'm, I was interested in the Vistula across centuries, so I, I didn't divide the river. Um, but also in other silenced rivers, uh, the Vistula's tributaries, because I, I was thinking that it's a living organism. I mean, what is left? Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's a living organism. It's a system. It's not just the, uh, the stream that is, uh, I'll show you the map, that, that goes from the Baltic Sea to the mountains. Yes, so. So you can see that from the from the it, it goes um, it me it meanders and it goes to uh, to the uh, to the south. So it's not only the stream, you know. This is what this modern cartography does. Yes, that, that imposes this vision that this is just you know a stream, but it's not. So um, yes, and you can see that in this map there are of course roads and uh, airports and. Uh, other things. So this is a draft of a first deep map that I um, uh, design, uh, of course, with with the help of of uh, of my team, and um, and it is something to um, to understand that when we get rid of humans and this um, uh, human, um, let's say, uh, layer, we can see not only a simple hydrographical map because it's uh, it's uh, it's not so well visible but uh, it's like uh, it's full of uh, little uh, rivers so uh, it's um, yeah it's you don't see because of the light here but uh, 
but it's uh, uh, the the map is uh, full of uh, uh, rivers that uh, that are like a network of veins. You know, when you and this shadow, it's like there is a shadow uh, that uh, I uh, created because of uh, to to see where is this Polish territory. But rivers have their own borders, and this question of the of border is very interesting if we uh, depoliticize this question, and it's, uh, it's not that we don't want to think about rivers as borders, because we can still ask this question, what kind of border it is for humans, yes? So, yeah, sorry for this, but it's better in my computer, definitely. And the smog area, it's Warsaw, and Warsaw since 16th century is one of the biggest source of um, both, in a way, voicing the river, but also silencing the river. But I thought it's a, it's a, it's like for a draft. It was a nice to see, you know, these shadows that are also connected with rising pollution is, uh, later. So yes, this will be visible better. Yes. <laughs> so via mapping the text, um, I came back to this uh, triangle. And uh, I distinguished some categories that I found in the sources since the beginning, I, you know, since the early, early um, Middle Age period chronicles. So, so I was working on the dictionary of this mapping as well. But also I wanted to show that in this triangle, they, I changed the, with, a, with a, an artist, we changed the colors because we wanted to show how these categories uh, overlap. Yes, so mm -hmm. it was interesting to see that, you know, what what are the relations and uh, and uh, and how they blur. So uh, I, I brought the case of contamination just for you to see, um, just for you to see that. Uh, you can even do something very simple with, you know, when you teach or when you want to engage uh, on a seminar, you can color the text, you know, because these are some directories. And I, I took a fragment from, uh, it's, it's a poem from the period of time when the rivers, not only in Poland, but also in Germany, were mo the, um, mostly polluted. Yes, I mean, the most was the 70s in the, la the last century, so in the 1970s. Uh, but also this poem re recaptures uh, um, some, uh, you know, long time of narrative of this river that has also very political, symbolical, nationalistic, uh, um, let's say, discourse, yes, and this is how it was communicated. So it was an idea to, to do it differently. And, um, and aquacritical triangle is also to decipher some, you know, some directories, yes. It will never be so simple to see this Blue River ecosystem. What does it mean that is, you know, it is, it is blue? But, uh, but it is about finding the river's voice when it's alive when it's, uh, um, when it's uh, definitely uh, free <laughs> because of the flow. And this voice, is, it's, there is a lot about movement. It's not so much, you know, the river will not, speak, it will speak, you know, like it, it can be anthropomorphized, but it's, the voice is a lot about, you know, moving freely. So this was, this was really uh, something that I was looking for. And red is, of course, for you know, when the river is colonized, when it's silenced, but when it's also appropriated. So, for example, the, the, the language of the river or the way how uh, she's animated is put into the, let's say, uh, into the language of propaganda, yes, or some other I, 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 human anthropocentric uh, uh, ideology. And I think the most uh, difficult, but perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps, um, um, promising for uh, environmental uh, history, which I consider it's more than history always. So uh, we are we are naturally born storytelling uh, animals, and uh, so environmental history for me 
uh, is also finding other sources to the anthropocentrize uh, historical uh, way of uh, speaking and writing and communicating. So this is also about human river relations. This is this yellow color, but uh, but but of course it uh, it is something that uh, that uh, makes also this concept more complex. I mean this uh, m uh, this triangle makes uh, that it operates not only in the opposition, like there is nature and there are, you know and there is culture. Yes? So this is the first wave of eco criticism. No. It, it has to be more complex, so we, we need to, you know, involve more the complexities, yes? Um, so triangulation, I think it's, uh, it's something that I think with, with all the time, you know, triangulating. And here you can see that I just uh, juxtapose some sources and, uh, and, uh, and uh, we work on just simple Excel that uh, uh, we uh, put um, this for this real disturbed as red as number one. So uh, in the end, after analyzing, um, well, all, all in all, well, if you would like to see the Atlas of Aquacritical Vistula, we deeply analyzed 164 sources. So historical, but also literary. And uh, I decided to uh, put them um, like I decided to choose only the red and blue in the end because uh, I wanted to show more two Vistulas. <laughs> so I wanted to do something very radical in the end and to show how from early modernity to, con to con contemporary period, yes, the river is straightened more. It's, uh, it's like it's disciplined more, what we were talking today. And um, and you can also see that with those um, uh, that I, we also noted indexed the, the the places where it is more silenced yes so but also there is this meandering alive and really I think speaking through uh, floods through uh, I think uh, it's just powerful nature that people really not only believe but they were uh, they were just uh, uh, it was something real for them and this is definitely early modernity but to some extent and this was some something new to some extent also period of 19th century especially uh, the second half of 19th century so industrialization urbanization going on in western europe but in Poland, we don't have um, we don't have a state, a political state. So the Vistula is also a voice of uh, not only the nation, but it, it starts to speak its own voice, and it's somehow protected in a way. So it's a it's a very peculiar because it might be different for I don't know the Rhine or the Danube. Yes, uh, uh, of course, it depends on the on the state. But in our sources, it was still quite loud, you know, in the in the nineteenth century. So, yes, so more or less this is it. I hope I didn't extend too much the time. <laughs> Thank you.